please take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 1. While you're turning there to Revelation 1, verse 9, let me say thank you to men who filled uh, roles last week while I was away. I'm grateful to be able to be away with family for uh, some time and spend some time with, with my brother and his wife, with my sister and my 87-year-old mom. It was a good, good time to uh, be together with them. and It's a sweet thing to be able to go away and know that um, you don't have to worry about what's going on here. God's given lots of faithful people and um, faithful brothers to labor with, faithful sisters who serve and, and help us. This is a good church, and I thank God for it. But as we anticipate our 10th anniversary and we celebrate uh, 10 years of ministry in Auburn, we don't say this is a good church because of us or because of anything necessarily that we've done right. We've survived 10 years by the mercy and grace of God alone. Because this is Christ's body. The church belongs to Jesus. And we ought to love the church because Jesus loves the church and is committed to her. Wholly, fully committed to her. And today, my aim in looking at this text is for you to see that that Christ has planted Himself firmly in the midst of His church with all of her um, flaws and weaknesses and brokenness because this church is, is led by sinners and the followers in the church are sinners and, and we are just a gathering of people who come together week by week desperately in need of a Savior and the provision of the grace of Christ. And... And in 10 years, we can look back and, and make a list of things that we've not done well, that, that give evidence that we're sinners. <laughs> and yet Christ is so faithful. And, and He has planted Himself in His church. He has given Himself for His church. And I want you to go away today thinking, with, with all of, of her brokenness, I am committed to the church because that's what Christ is committed to. And to be opposed to the church is to be opposed to Christ. I, hope you can, I want you to be able to see that and, and embrace it. And stop thinking about the church as the place that you go around looking for the place that suits you best. So don't go around looking. There are some students here that are visiting with us today, maybe for the first time, and families uh, whose faces I don't recognize. I'm thankful that you're here. Thank God for you. I want to encourage you to find the place where God wants you to be. But don't go around looking like you're shopping for a car because this is not a beauty contest. And, and you won't find the church that won't somewhere along the way disappoint you or fail you or um, hurt you because they're all filled with sinners. And, but the church, Jesus is in the midst of the church. And so the church is God's plan. And, and so you need to be committed to the church and love the church like Jesus does. All right? Now, as, as we look to this text, um, I, I want to talk about Grace Heritage Church and the church today, I guess in a general sense, and, and, and the church that's being spoken of here in Revelation all at the same time. Why can I do that? Well, there, there are some things that bind us together. We are one body in, in one sense in Christ because we have the same Savior in the head so we're bound together and we share together in some particular things. We share in <clears throat> some experiences that belong to the church and in thinking about these experiences I hope you'll start to use them as your gauge for what you ought to be expecting to experience in being connected to the church. Not some other criteria but this is what the church is about some shared experiences, and, and then, of course, our, our shared Savior, that we have one all-sufficient Savior, and that binds us together. We share in that, and, 
And then we also anticipate or look forward to the returning judge who is our king. Those are some things that are painted in this picture. This is a portrait in Revelation chapter 1 verse 9. It is, is a vision that God gives to, the, to John um, around 90 AD. So just like the text that Brandon read from this morning, this text is written several decades after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And it uses some rather wild language. Uh, it's, it's a language that helps us to picture some things in its symbolic nature about Christ and who He is as our Savior and our coming King. And I'd like for us to begin reading in verse 9, if we could. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters." In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. This is the Word of God for our ears today. May God give us grace to hear Him speak to us about the church that Christ loves. The first thing that, that I'd like for you to notice with me out of this text is that with the church and in the church, we have a shared experience. We're bound together by a shared experience. And John speaks of those things when he begins there in verse 9. I, John, your brother and partner. That word partner means one who's uh, sh he's a fellow sharer or a fellow traveler or somebody who's taking part with you in something. And so he's speaking to the churches, but I would, would submit to you that he's also speaking to you today, not just to them, but to, to us as we gather as the church today, that he shares with us in some particular things. And then he lists them. He's a partner in the tribulation, the kingdom, and patient endurance. Let's think about the fact that we share tribulation with the church or in the church. Um, why was John on the Isle of Patmos? Look in the text in verse 9. As he says, he was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. The reason John was exiled to the island of Patmos, which was like, picture Alcatraz out in the um, edges of the Pacific Ocean. An island which was a, a penal colony set aside for the worst of prisoners. People got taken there and left to rot, essentially. And, and that's the picture of Patmos. John exiled to this island, this penal island, where he is, is imprisoned because of his preaching the gospel. Simply holding forth the word. John lived in a day when Rome was the government in charge and Christianity was declared illegal because it was seen as a threat against the state. And so those who held forth the, the word of Christ and the gospel of Christ were going to be seen as a threat to civil order and the, the popularity of the state. And, and that was the common experience of the day. And I'm not probably telling you anything you don't know, but I'll remind you that 2 Timothy chapter 3, in particular verse 13, says that all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And in Acts chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas were preaching the, the gospel, the good news, in a, a town called Iconium. 
And both Jews and Gentiles made a plan under the, the leadership of some rulers there to stone them. And they escaped when they heard the message that that was what was being planned for the two missionaries. In Romans chapter 5, Paul says, We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And Jesus himself said in, in John 16, 33, that in this world you will have tribulation. Just this past week, we got news from friends who serve in the, the Middle East that they were having to leave their homes and their place of service and they were thankfully able to travel to another country. And we've heard all kinds of reports out of that part of the world and some of them are difficult to verify, but our friend wrote that in cities nearby, Christians were being raped and killed. And, and he knows this for a fact. And so even non-Christians, just those who refuse the option of converting to Islam are being killed and tortured and they're being driven from their homes in this day because they, they don't knuckle under to the, the religious rule of that area and to the people that have the most guns right now. And so in the day of Jesus and in the day of John and the experience of the first century church and in the experience of the church today, tribulation's going on. Now, I'm, I'm saying all this in the context of a culture where sometimes our most difficult persecution is that the microwave is broken or that we have to wait a long time in the line at Wendy's, four or five minutes. I talked to a friend who manages a fast food restaurant this week and he said that their goal, if they haven't taken your order and served you in 75 seconds, they've missed the target. That that's unacceptable. You know, that's the culture we live in. And so, brothers and sisters, we can have a tendency in the American Western church to think about the church as the place that serves us what we want, when we want, as we want it, and never fails. One of my friends 20 years ago summarized their idea of the Christian life this way. It just shouldn't be hard. Now, if that kind of thinking has penetrated your mind and you begin to think about the church in the way that, that says, well, if there's difficulty involved in being connected with it, I don't want it, repent. Turn, turn from that idea and, re and remember that the thing that binds the church together is a shared experience of tribulation. And, and Jesus is there in the midst of that for us and with us. Um, in God's mercy, we don't face much of it, and yet there may be the day that it's coming. Well, I need to press along and go um, to this next thing, which is going to be brief, so listen quickly. Not only are, are we sharing in the participation in tribulation and may need to one day. Oh, can I just back up? I'm sorry, I didn't get to preach last week, so I'm like out of practice. But can I just back up for one second and say, what, what does this say to your heart about the way you think about the Christian experience? That the, one of the things that marks the church and belongs to the church and that, that Jesus says is right with the church even right now is that, that tribulation is involved, difficulty, hardship, um, um, some level of self-sacrifice. What does it say to your heart? What heart attitudes may need to be adjusted by God's help today as you're thinking about the church and what you expect of her and in your relationship with her uh, and from her? Okay? What, what does that say to your heart about those kinds of things and how does it need to be adjusted? You might ask yourself this question, is the church the organization that meets your needs or the place where you serve and participate in God's kingdom? And I understand that your needs, we have needs that need to be met. I'm not saying that you should come here and never be helped <laughs> or, or never be cared for or loved or supported. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying in terms of the attitude and the way we think about the church and why we're committed to her, what, what is, is your heart attitude? Okay, secondly, not only are we participants or share or we bound together by a tribulation, but we are participants in the kingdom of God. John says, I, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom. And just quickly remember that Mark said, in, or in Mark chapter 1, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here it is. 
repent and believe the good news of the gospel. And so our uh, idea of the kingdom needs to be that it has come. It is not fully consummated, but we are participating together in the kingdom of God, which means we have a king, which means are our hearts submitted to him? Are we thinking about the church in terms of how it calls us to be submitted to him and to his word and to his expression of authority through the church and through his word by the power of the Spirit as we participate in the kingdom of God. That's the way that we need to be thinking about the church as participants in the kingdom. Thirdly, John says, we share in patient endurance. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance. This is the call of every Christian. And I'll just point you to Revelation chapter 2. Verses 2 through 3 where Jesus says, I know of your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. And in verse 3 he says, I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. And you have not grown weary. Or in chapter 3 verse 10 he says, Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming to the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. We belong to this kingdom and so as a result need to exercise patient endurance. And, and again, I would say that one way we can do that is in the reality that the church is not yet what she should be. The pastors are sinners like you are and in equal desperate need of the grace of God. The people who sit around you are sinners in need of the grace of God. We are flawed and broken people. And so we are constantly coming together, not because we have it all together, but because we desperately need the gospel of Christ. And so we patiently endure with the things that go on around us that are sometimes broken and flawed and disappointing, quite honestly. We, we bear up with one another in love. We endure one another in the process of being molded into the image of Christ. And so the scriptures uh, are, are speaking to these people who need to hear these reminders in the midst of their tribulation and difficulty and brokenness, but they need to be heard by us as well. And so we have this shared experience of tribulation, of belonging to the kingdom, and of needing to patiently endure with one another as we press along. And I want to encourage you to have these things in mind as you're thinking about the church. And, and stop critiquing and evaluating and start participating in the way that, that God has called us to participate. Bearing up together with patient endurance as members of the kingdom of God who are going to endure tribulation until Christ comes again. Secondly, big idea, we are the church, we are, I mean, and I say the church, but we are defined by a single all-sufficient Savior. In verses 10 and following, John goes on to say, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in the book to, and send it to the seven churches. Now I want to stop and say these are seven literal churches that are in the area that's now like southwestern Turkey. Uh, and and they, they formed sort of a circuit and it was a male circuit, actually. Places where there was a male, you know, a, a, what would you call a, a guy who rides a camel? A camel Express, you know? Or Arabian horses, Pony Express. It, through that part of the world, making sure that communication was established between the churches. And so he's saying, send this to these literal seven churches. But the number seven is significant, and it speaks to the church as well. So those are real churches with real people in them, but he's also speaking to the church in general um, in this uh, text and communicating these same things to the church at large, not just those seven churches. And as he is in this vision, thinking about what's being written, John turns in verse 12 and he looks to see the voice that was speaking to him and on turning saw seven golden lampstands. Another way of saying the churches. And here not churches that are bound together by one ethnicity but seven individual lampstands. So 
speaking to the church gathered of people of multiple uh, languages and nationalities and backgrounds and all of those kinds of things. So, so he's talking about the church as we understand it today as, as I see this text. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. So John, in his vision, turns to hear and look to where the voice is coming from and he sees the resurrected Christ standing in the midst of his churches so that they are dependent on him, looking to him, um, hanging on him, if you will. Jesus completely committed to his church, the Lord of the church and dwelling amongst them, the shepherd of the church, the foundation of the church, the one who died for the church and is now living for the church, the one who defends the church, the one who is glorified in the church, the one who is coming one day to present to himself the church as a bride without blemish and without spot. In Isaiah chapter 22, verse 24, there is a text that introduces us to a godly servant of the Old Testament named Eliakim. And the text pictures Eliakim as a peg driven into the wood. And on this peg is hung all the vessels of Eliakim's house. And he's, he's essentially saying... Here is a, a man to whom Israel can look and count on for godly leadership and help. And, and yet the, the next verse says, but this peg will be sheared off later. So it reminds us that he's still just a man. But if you'll go back to the image with me for a minute. You know, I have in my little workroom at my house, some, it's, it's not a finished room, so the two by fours are exposed. And I can drive a nail in there and hang stuff on the nail. And so imagine one giant nail on which everything in my workshop can be hung. The little insignificant uh, pipe clamps that I have or the hose clamps, the little pieces of metal, they're just a little piece of metal like this and hang them on there. And the table saw and everything else from the little insignificant screws to the most important tool, everything hanging on the one nail. That's kind of the picture that's being painted. Octavius Winslow, in writing about, his ch about the church, says, Jesus Christ is the peg driven into the wood, the immovable nail on which all the vessels of His church hang and are supported. And the, from the, the, the least significant to the biggest, the, the Isaiah text says, from the cups to the big bowls, the big mixing bowls. I'm trying to... Well, let me just tell you some things that Winslow says if, if you find yourself as one of those little insignificant vessels that hangs on the cup or on the nail. One maybe who struggles to serve Christ. Maybe some days you, you take up the cross and follow Him well and other days you just put it down because you, you're tired. One who sometimes understands the Scriptures and thrills to read them and other days you just got no desire to read the Word. And, and you skip for a few days. Maybe you're, you're one who, who serves faithfully in some ways and then you go a month and you don't share the gospel with anybody. And maybe you're, you're the person who prays a lot and then other days you're just prayerless and you have no desire to do it. And he goes to say that the idea that's presented in Isaiah 22 or 24 is, is for us, for the encouragement of our hearts when we feel like those little insignificant cups that can't hold much and can't do much and aren't worth much. But our, our, our hope is the stability of the peg on which we're hung. I think that's the, the, the basis for that hymn that we sing um, sometimes that says, Other refuge have I none, hangs my helpless soul on thee. And Winslow goes on to write and say that this weakness that I've been talking about may be some of the features that mark your case. Yet feeling your own vileness and Christ's sufficiency and preciousness and constrained to hang on Him solely and exclusively 
as all your salvation and all your desire, though you can receive but a small quantity of knowledge and of grace and of love, you are yet a vessel of gold in His house. And Jesus bears you on His heart, sets you as a seal upon His arm, and presents you each moment before God complete in Himself. We have a single, all-sufficient Savior. God, help me. I don't feel like I've explained some, that last ten minutes may have just been completely muddled in your hearing. And I pray the Spirit of God would help it to make sense. Christ is the one on whom we are hung for our very, the good of our very souls eternally. And He presents us each moment before God complete in himself. Thirdly, not only do we are we bound together as the church that suffers and, and perseveres together, not only are we bound together in a single sufficient Savior, but we anticipate the judgment of the King. Verses 13 and following, and we're going to press through these pretty quickly. Um, and the, one of the first things I want to point out to you here is, I mentioned this a minute ago, that these are symbols. Notice how many times that the Apostle John uses the word like. And he's not trying to be, he's not saying, so I was like in a vision, and I was like taken up into the third heaven, and, and I was like, he's not saying that. He is saying, he is painting a portrait of Christ. And if someone took these descriptions literally, they would paint a monster. And so he uses the word like to help us understand he's using symbolic language. Well, what's he saying about Jesus, the resurrected Christ, when he says that he was one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest? He's saying that um, as this great one is pictured in Daniel chapter 7, the one of a, with the authority to go to the Ancient of Days and to open the scroll and to read the names that are in in it, he is one who is full of majesty. He is uh, uh, established with dignity and with authority and the authority that can carry out judgment. What does he mean when he says that his head was white? The hairs of his head were white like wool or like snow. Well, he's, he's saying now that he is the Ancient of Days and he's attributing the, the qualities and the characteristics of the Divine Father to the Son without even missing a beat. And the white hair seen on the Ancient of Days is stressing His eternality, His agelessness, the ever-present I Am. And so there John sees the judge who is eternal. What does he mean when he says that His eyes were like a flame of fire? Well, he's referring to the penetrating vision in, that in judgment burns through all the hypocrisy and all the pretense and deceit and sham and deception. It sees inside of us more clearly than any x-ray or MRI or CAT scan could do. And so he says that he's coming as the judge who has all insight. Everyone is laid bare before the one to, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> to whom we must give an account. The coming judge has all insight. No one will deceive him. In verse 15, what does it mean when it says his feet were like burnished bronze refined in a, for a, a furnace? Bronze is this metal that's, that's heavy, it's irresistible, and, and it is, if, it, if his feet are made of bronze and he's walking over his enemies, and that's the picture to tread over anyone or anything with your feet is to demonstrate victory. It's to, to have his foot on the neck of his, of his enemies and to hold them down. And so he comes in judgment, treading out the wrath of God like one who would press on grapes. And so John sees in this judge a coming one who is unstoppable. Or in the second part of verse 15, what does he mean when he says, His voice was like the roar of many waters? Well, The pictures through the Old Testament tell us of the the coming glory of God being pictured by the sound of a roaring water. It's awe-inspiring. It's not like the gentle lapping of a creek that gurgles down the hillside and, and ambles its way towards the bottom of a hill. It's, it's, it's Hurricane Katrina wrecking wrath and fury on the city of New Orleans. It's a tsunami 
crushing over a, a, a land, taking the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. It's, it's an awe-inspiring, fear-inducing sight and sound. And that's the picture of the coming glory of God. The very words of His voice inspire awe and fear. And that's John hears this coming judge whose words inspire awe and fear. Six, verse 16, in his right hand he held seven stars. What, what does he mean when he talks about these seven stars? Well, it's another way to refer, of referring to the churches. And to be in the right hand speaks of protection and favor and ownership. And so as John sees this one who holds the churches in his right hand, he speaks of one who is going to protect his people. And he is the coming judge who's going to watch after his people. And so I would encourage you not to be the one who insults or rejects the church. Second part of verse 16. What does John mean when he says that his, his, uh, in his mouth was a sharp two-edged sword? Well, he speaks to the weapon of judgment that Christ will wield. Isaiah 50, 49 prophesies that Christ will have his mouth made like a sharpened sword. In Revelation 19, the sword is said to strike down the nations in judgment as an instrument that he wields. And so John sees the judge who is coming and his judgment is invincible. can't be resisted. It's, it's a power that can't be stopped. And, and it, we're reminded that God who spoke and brought the universe into existence also will speak and crush his enemies. And then the last part of verse 16 he says his face was like the sun shining in full strength. And he, he sp speaks to the glory of the coming judge. You remember when on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus' face shone like the sun? Well, John sees it again now. And it is radiant and so brilliant that, that you can't look into it and behold it. It would be looking like, like looking into the sun and trying to, to gaze there. So he sees the judge who is coming as a conquering king full of glory. Brilliance and radiant. John sees in the coming judge majestic authority. No enemy will ever overrule him. He sees divine eternality. No enemy will outlast him. He sees penetrating insight. No enemy will deceive him. He sees unstoppable wrath. No enemy will resist him. He sees fear-inducing speech. No enemy will defy him or argue with him or talk his way out of judgment. He sees protective ownership. No enemy will ever overcome him or touch his bride, the church. He sees an invincible weapon. No enemy will ever survive him. He sees conquering glory. No enemy will ever vanquish him. He is the Lord of the church and he is on our side. And that's why you and I must be connected to the church. We, we, we must love the church. Because to be separated from the church is to be the enemy of God. And what does that say to my heart about my attitudes towards the church? What adjustments need to be made? And how should I glory in Christ who has provided so great a salvation? And how should I love his bride? How should I positively commit myself to serve and, and be a part of what God is doing in his church and through his church? I'm not, I'm not talking about getting busy. I'm talking about loving the church, being committed to her in all of her brokenness and with her warts and sinfulness and all of those kinds of things. Loving the church. I love this church, and I do love you. Um, but it's because Christ loves us first. If you're apart from Christ today, this judge is coming to execute his judgment on you. And so I don't want to call you today as we're finishing up to submit your heart and life to Christ, to repent of sin and ask Him to make you a part of His bride, His church. Ask Him to redeem you. Ask Him to rescue you from the coming judgment. Because today you may meet Him as 
the great high priest that we read about in Hebrews chapter 4. The one to whom you can go for help in time of need. But in that day, he is not coming as a high priest. He is coming as a judge. So I call you today to repentance and to faith in Christ. The only sufficient Savior as your King. Let's bow together before we continue. Father, please bring fruit from the reading of your scriptures, from the prayers of your people, and from the preaching of your word. To the praise and glory of your own grace, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.